So in this lecture segment, I'm going to discuss the three types of protection devices that we're going to be dealing with this semester. We've got the feeder circuit breaker at the top of the circuit. We're going to have fuses. We'll get into later on um, in this lecture, what's the difference between a fast tap fuse and a slow tap fuse. And then we're also going to have a, a type of specialized pull top circuit breaker uh, we're going to refer to as a recloser. That could actually be in a three phase form or a single phase form. We talked about the feeder circuit breaker just briefly in the introductory lecture uh, at the beginning of the semester. And this is basically a special type of switch we have to interrupt short circuit currents on the feeder. And so what you'll have in here is you'll have some type of fault current interruption mechanism in the older switches, this could have been oil, and the newer switches this is more likely to be vacuum technology. And what we need to have in conjunction with this feeder circuit breaker is we need to have something that monitors the currents and perhaps even the voltages and is used to indicate that there's a fault on the circuit. And so once a fault on the circuit's been detected, then this uh, relay device will actually send the appropriate signals to the feeder circuit breaker in order to operate open. Um, when it comes time to close back in again, the, the same relay can send uh, closed signals to this circuit breaker. This circuit breaker has three different poles for say like the phases A, B, and C. And normally what we do for these top of feeder breakers is we usually operate them in a three phase configuration. In other words, they're all gagged. The reason being is if we have three phase customers on the circuit, say like commercial customers or industrial customers, that we don't want to have unbalanced voltages being applied to their loads. And so to keep that from happening, we would typically operate all the three switches open or all three switches closed. The relay itself is some type of a, usually it's a microprocessor based device nowadays. Uh, in the past, this was an electromechanical type of a device. And what this device does is it monitors the voltages and currents, which are connect up, connected up to the back of the relay. And so this is where you're going to have the inputs for the voltage PTs and the current CTs. And then when it comes time to actually provide the signaling to the circuit breaker, there could actually be a separate set of input outputs um, contacts, which are used for this, or maybe you just use the existing in out binaries that are available on the back of the relay, it just sort of depends. But this relay would be the device that would have the overcurrent detection functionality that we talked about in the previous lecture, say like the, the number 50 and 51 overcurrent functions. And it has a number of different ANSI functions as well for doing protection. One thing I wanted to point out before I get to the recloser is that the feeder circuit breaker can do reclosing operations. And what we can have on a circuit is not only faults that are permanent, but also faults that are temporary. And so let's suppose I have a fault on the circuit and there's a possibility that fault could be temporary. What we can do is we can operate this feeder circuit breaker open wait for a certain period of time and, and then actually reclose that breaker. And it could turn out that if that fault were temporary, that the fault would be cleared automatically and we could continue to operate the circuit normally. Sometimes it takes multiple operations where we have to open, close, open, close. Maybe we have to do this one, two, three, four times, but Many times, again, if these faults are temporary, we can go through a reclosing set of cycles. And so this set of operations is what's referred to as reclosing. And so even though we, we don't call this a recloser, typically it can have reclosing functionality. So the, the ANSI protection function for this is what's referred to as number 79. 
One thing you have to be aware of is if you operate this feeder circuit breaker in a reclosing manner, that every time you go through a reclosing cycle, you de-energize the circuit to clear the fault, is that all the load on the circuit's going to be de-energized as well, right? So what happens is if you have this feeder circuit breaker going through reclosing cycles, that all these loads are basically going to be interrupted temporarily. And the problem is we don't know ahead of time if I if this relay for the circuit breaker sees a fault, we don't know ahead of time if it's going to be permanent or, or temporary. And so many times if we're going through these reclosing cycles and we're repeatedly applying the, the fault in an attempt to clear it, uh, where maybe it's going to just be permanently. And then what happens is the relay realizes that and it just simply locks out the circuit breaker and doesn't attempt to do any more reclosing operations. Fuses are widely used throughout these distribution circuits, and they basically protect the upstream devices for, from overcurrents caused by faults. The, the fuse eventually blows, and what this does is it isolates the fault section from the healthy part of the circuit. So what this does is it gives us sectionalizing functionality. If we wanted to manually reconfigure a circuit, um, if there's no fault on this, say like the, the, the section that the fuse is protecting, we can also operate that circuit open by just simply taking the fuse out. We can actually treat that as, as if it were like a manual single phase switch. And so the fuse is, a, is basically an element, it's like a sacrificial piece of wire. It's made out of some type of a soft metal, like a say like tin. And when it's exposed to a high current, it, it just performs, say, like a small piece of wire and that the current going through it would eventually heat up the element to the point where it would melt. And so when this fuse element melts in, then if you have a large amount of current flowing through there, that fuse is replaced by a plasma arc. And eventually what we have to have is some sort of mechanism in there where that arc kind of gets blown out, if you want to think about it that way. And fuses would typically have ratings that relate to the maximum load current that they're designed to carry. And so this shows how a fuse would actually be mounted in a distribution circuit. We have what's called this fuse cutout. The fuse itself is actually located in this barrel. And so within this uh, barrel, what you have is you have this fuse link element. This is actually replaceable. So if a fuse would blow, we could just simply take the barrel out, replace the fuse wire, and put it back into the fuse cutout. And we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the semester, but what you would do if you had like a lateral that you wanted to have come off of a main feeder is you would put a mechanical tap on that primary overhead. You would run this through one side of the fuse cut out and you have then the other side going to the, the lateral. And so this is sometimes what we refer to as a, as a tapped um, lateral because it basically is just using a tap on the, on the main feeder. But all most laterals would typically have a, a fuse cut out at the very beginning of the, the lateral segment. And this could be single phase or two phase or even, even three phase. So one thing I wanted to just make it very clear when we're talking about fuses, especially these, what we call these expulsion fuses that don't limit the, the fault current. And that the way these would work is you would have your normal current. And then what would happen at some point, the current would start to go above the normal value due to a fault. And so when the current gets up to a certain point, let's say the fault starts to occur right here, the current starts to jump up. And that increase in current is going to blow that fuse link. And that fuse link in this little diagram here would blow out at time point three. Now, just because that fuse link blows out doesn't mean that the fault's cleared because what happens is so much current was going through there that it, it's 
it's caused plasma to form and this plasma actually conducts the fault current. And so in the case of a fuse, we don't actually remove the fault until we go through a natural current zero, right? So we actually have to see a current zero in an AC circuit before the faults permanently cleared. Besides having ratings that correspond to the amount of load these fuses can carry, um, we've also got designations that relate to the speed of the fuse. And so we can have like a, say like a type KS fuse. This is a, a relatively slow fuse, which is usually used to protect say like transformers and, and lines where these would be less sensitive to say like current transit. So if we had temporary increases in current, uh, the fuse wouldn't blow out. Now there's cases where you want the fuse to blow as soon as possible. Say like if you have a fault on a cable, cable faults are typically always permanent. And so to avoid damage to the cable, we want that fuse to blow out as quickly as possible. Maybe the same with capacitor bags. And so in this case, you have what's called a type K fuse, which is very, very fast. And so as soon as that current level increases, you, you want that to blow out as, as fast as you can. You would also have a type T fuse, which is slower than a K type fuse. And this is what we would sometimes use to protect tap lines, where we may need to have some coordination with an upstream recloser. And so what you would do in this case is you would use these types of fuses below reclosers where you need to have a special type of recloser fuse coordination. And we'll talk later on about where you would use say like a K type fuse versus a T type fuse. And you have other sort of fuse designations as well, but these are some of the common ones that we would be using in this class. And so just to show you how the characteristics would differ, I, I shown in this diagram right here, two different sort of time current characteristics for fuses. As we discussed before, basically these have time, what we call inverse time current characteristics where the larger the current is, the, the faster the fuse would blow out. And so if I have a, a T20 fuse, which is shown in the green curve, this is designed to carry 20 amperes of load current and this fuse would start to melt at two times this current. So it starts to melt at 40 amperes. You can see in this diagram in green that when we hit 40 amperes, and keep in mind this is a log scale. So when we hit 40 amperes, it starts to melt, but it takes a long, long time for this fuse to melt completely. You know, we're talking about over hundred seconds. Now, if this current were higher, let's say this current gets up into the hundreds or maybe up into the thousand ampere range, you can see it, it blows out much more quickly. We also show a T40 fuse, which is shown in blue, and this is designed to carry 40 amperes of load current. And so the curve would be kind of shifted over a little bit due to the fact it carries more uh, load current. And the, the time it would take to um, blow out for a given current level would be slightly time shifted as well with respect to the T20 fuse. What you'll also see with these fuse characteristics is not it's not a single line. There's a lower curve and an upper curve. We have what we call minimum melt and maximum clear because there's a little bit of uncertainty in terms of when the, the fuse blows depending on the inception of the fault and maybe some tolerances in the in the fuse material. So anyway, um, we'll we'll get into this later on, you know, why we're sort of interested in knowing what these fuse characteristics look like. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of faults are temporary in nature, and we could use reclosing actions in the top of feed or circuit breaker in order to clear them so we wouldn't have to a permanent outage, right? There's a special type of circuit breaker that's that uh, has been developed to work at the overhead distribution level, you know, away from the substation called, a, we just simply call it a pole top recloser, which a lot of times just say it's a recloser, right? And so it's a special type of a self-contained unit 
it may or may not have the relay or the um, protection functionality embedded into the the unit itself. So sometimes it's embedded into the unit. Sometimes it's in a the relay or the protection is actually in a separate box. But this is a special type of device we developed to kind of help maintain service continuity after temporary types of faults. These could be manufactured as single phase devices. These could be manufactured as three phase devices. And many times these are actually designed in a way to actually coordinate with fuses. We'll see um, in the next lecture segment exactly how this, this gets done. Um, but anyway, this is this is a special device type. And the other thing it does is it gives us the ability of improving selectivity. It would be rather expensive to, if I want to just like say break the feeder into two different zones, zone one and zone two, to put a regular feeder circuit breaker out in the field. Um, you know, we'd have to find a way of mounting it. It'd be relatively expensive. But what these reclosers are designed for is for kind of retrofit scenarios where we can just simply find a location up at the pole and put these out there and then basically break the circuit into multiple zones, protection zones by putting these reclosers out there. As far as the ratings associated with these pole top reclosers, um, what you'll typically see is you'll see these things designed for certain voltage levels. They'll be designed to carry so much continuous current or normal load current, they'll be designed to interrupt so much fault current. These devices also operate using curves that are very, very similar to fuses. They're inverse time overcurrent characteristics, so they can work with the, the fuses. And as I mentioned before, in order to clear faults if they're temporary, we may need to go through one, two, three, four cycles of opening and closing the switch in order to clear the fault. So these are specially designed to do multiple operations. Uh, this sh shows some data for uh, a Viper switch. It's made by a company called GNW Electric. And this shows some of the, the data associated with the different types of switches available, which are designed to operate at the 15, 25, and 35 kV voltage levels. And so you'll typically see different voltage classes of equipment. Um, and then what you'll see in the in the data sheets that they're designed to carry so much continuous current. This is what it could carry in steady state. So this would correspond to the normal load current. And then what you'll also see is you see the interrupting capability in terms of kiloamperes. So when we're talking about three-phase switches, uh, nowadays, a lot of times these are in packages that we sometimes refer to as electronic line reclosers. You'll have many times three separate poles. These, these poles are associated with vacuum switch technology. They have like a magnetic actuation, some kind of magnetic, special magnetic device, which opens and closes each switch. Typically, you'll see a, a medium voltage enclosure, which gets mounted on the top of poles. And then it, for the logic, for the protection logic, this is typically in a separate box located further down the pole, where you would actually have a, a standalone relay doing the protection functionality. So this relay box has to come up with the, the switching signals, which gets sent to this medium voltage enclosure, which is triggering these uh, magnetic actuators in, in this particular box right here. So this would be one type of package, which you could see, and then again, the trends are to, to use more electronic line reclosers. You could also see these older types of hydraulic units being used. And this, this shows an older hydraulic single phase pole top recloser. This is all analog. Um, and this would be an oil fill tank, CD's oil for clearing the fault. Everything's built in, but it's all built in in terms of analog technology. And 
even though these devices don't have as much flexibility as electronic devices, um, they're relatively inexpensive and very, very robust. And so, especially if you're looking at doing single phase reclosing, this type of package is still used by a lot of utilities in lieu of having like a single phase electronic recloser, which is actually can be pretty expensive because of the additional relay that's required. And so you'll see both the 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 three phase electronic reclosers, you'll see the hydraulic single phase reclosers. You could also see some electronic single phase reclosers, but but this package can usually do what's required in uh, most of the cases. The recloser's themselves they have inverse time current curves similar to fuses. And you'll see they would have both slow and fast curves. You have what to call two sets of curves, you, know, you have slow trip curves and fast trip curves. And so the recloser can actually toggle back and forth between a fast curve and a slow curve. And we'll see in the next section why we need to have these two different curve families, but it turns out that the fuse characteristics are actually between these two families of curves, and we use this for actually doing coordination um, with, with the fuses out in the field. So just kind of keep this in mind that the recloser has characteristics compatible with fuses, but we can actually um, select the curve family to use and we can actually have this operate in the fast trip mode or operate in a slow trip. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, you know, as far as the, the placement of the recloser is not only is this used to help deal with temporary faults, but actually you can improve protection selectivity and, and later on the reliability lectures, we'll see how this could be used to improve our reliability indices. And so as a baseline, what you could have is you could have a feeder circuit breaker protecting a distribution circuit that just has fuses. You don't have to have these pull top reclosers at all, all right? So we could have a top of the feeder breaker, we could just have fuses all over the place, but the, but the thing would be is that this feeder circuit breaker would have to be able to respond to every uh, fault type on the circuit. And then if we had any type of a permanent fault on here on the main feeder, we, we could only respond by operating that feeder circuit breaker. So a permanent fault anywhere on this backbone causes all the customers on the circuit to see an outage. Now we could, break this feeder into two parts, three parts, four parts, et cetera. In this case, what we're showing is we're showing what's referred to as a midpoint recloser. So we're basically breaking the circuit in two. And then what we can do is if we had a fault down here, we just would operate that downstream line recloser in that midpoint device. Now, if the fault were up here, we'd still have to operate the circuit breaker, but at least we'd have some flexibility for faults in the bottom half of the circuit being cleared by the line recloser. And then anybody above the line recloser would still have service again. So we'll get into, the, into this in the reliability section. You know, what's our criteria for placing these reclosers? And what we can do is we can actually kind of shape the reliability that we're going to get on these circuits through the, the placement of these reclosing devices.